and he would show me cartoons. Now every cartoon has a line of action to show, to tell the story is the little mouse jumping forward or being punched backwards, you know? So it's those big things that are really important and that's what's gonna make your work great. So if you don't have the big stuff correct, nobody's gonna to wanna to walk up to your piece to look at the little stuff. You are gonna be in for a treat today. Rick Caselli is gonna teach you about 3D art, about sculpture, but not only sculpture, but sculpture for painters, something that will be extremely valuable to you. Rick, welcome to day number 251. Wow, thanks, Eric, it's a pleasure. You have the distinction of being the first artist after day 250, and, and so, we just wrapped up 250 days of this, and now we're going to work on the next 250. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Congrats. That's a lot. Great. So uh, uh, tell us a little bit about where you are and, and uh, what you're going to do today. Well, I'm here at my private studio in Maryland uh, near Washington, D.C. And um, it's a, as you can see, it's Northlight Studio. So I'll give you a tour of the studio, maybe talk about how I built this space. And um, then I'm going to go into some sculptural concepts that relate to portraiture. So okay. I was I'm a portrait painter mainly, or portrait sculptor mainly, but I started as a painter. So I sort of have a unique, um, you know, uh, I guess vantage point because I, I uh, began as a painter and then I transitioned to sculpture about eight years ago professionally. So most of my students are painters and they want to come learn the form, the anatomy, the planes, the proportions in clay. And um, so that's mainly, you know, what I offer that's unique. And I'll also talk about some of my, uh, my online teaching now in this new, new age of uh, lockdowns. Yeah. Um, well, we have, uh, I, I have had uh, many great painters tell me that the trans transformative moment for them, even though many of them had been painting for decades, uh, the transformative moment came from when they started sculpting because sculpting really helped them see form uh, in, a, in a whole different way. And, and George Carlson, who is one of the great landscape painters uh, of our time, as, as of course also was a famous sculptor. And he said, your work will be completely different once you start sculpting, which is why I have a box of clay and I'm ready to jump in. So I'm I'm eager to learn. I might become one of those online students. Okay, well, don't be afraid. It's, it's just clay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I am afraid. So you're gonna help us overcome that. So Rick, we'll be right back with you in just a minute. I'm all gonna right. just drop off, make a couple of quick announcements, all right? Okay, it looks like we're in the studio. Yeah, I'll give you a quick studio tour. All right. Um, so this, this structure was originally a two car garage. So really? I, kept, I kept the old concrete and just tore everything else down. Um, and then we built up. So this, the wall with the North light windows is uh, 20 feet tall. And um, that's really key. You know, a lot of people build studios and they have plenty of money, but they don't have the right design. So it doesn't necessarily take more money. It just takes, you know, a good design. And, and what's really key is to get those windows as high as you can. Now, is that true for sculpting as well, or is that for I mean, for painting, or is that only for sculpting? I'd say for, for both. And if, if you're a sculptor, um, you could do a skylight studio. Admittedly, my studio is a little more like a painting studio because the, the uh, windows are vertical. Um, so the light is going to come in, you know, from the side and rake across. But, but I block off those lower windows, and it really comes, it trickles down from the top pretty much. Um, but... Yeah, just get them up as high as you can. That's all I can say. And get it north or northeast facing. It's a very ambient light. You can see I don't have to turn the lights on during the day. Yeah. Uh, I have my big barn doors here in case I need to move large pieces in and out of the studio. So How those large are, will you sculpt? Well, you know, I this is 12 feet tall, so I'm limited to that in this studio. But um, I didn't want to be limited to a, a regular size door. Um, so anyway, I, I got that idea from Daniel Chester French, his studio. Um, here's some of my paintings actually. So again, I started as a portrait painter 
indoor and outdoor portraits. Very nice. Um, here's some of my portrait sculptures in plaster and resin and terracotta. Now uh, let's talk about that. Uh, yeah. the, the differences between the various things that you would sculpt in plaster, resin, terracotta, et cetera. What, what's the pros and cons of each of those? Well, for me, I, I mainly sculpt everything in clay first. Um, and then it'll either be fired in a kiln like a terracotta, or if it's a plastiline head, I'll make a mold of it and then have it reproduced into plaster or bronze, or this is a resin cast. So I mainly do it through mold making, not through firing, but sometimes I fire a few pieces here and there. Um, and I'm not really a stone carver, I don't carve, so. My piece and, are made in clay. What you use, you say clay, but there's different kinds of clay I've learned since I've started sculpting. There's, um, do you use oil clay? I generally do. Uh, and this is oil clay here. This is a little sculpture of my daughter. And you can see this clay, it never dries out. So it can just sit here. And until I'm done, it'll be there, uh, ready to get molded later. So uh, you say it never dries out, but I had, I, I don't mean to challenge you on that, but I had done a small piece uh, and it uh, it was a small, thin piece and it got very brittle over time. Is it, So is, is is there a point at which it does dry? Uh, sometimes it, it can crack and the oil can ooze away from the, um, you know, the solid mass of the, of the plastiline, but you can usually heat it up and reconstitute it with more oil. I would say that it usually takes 10 years for it to start to really maybe separate, but you know, it depends. There's a lot of different oil-based clays out there. So I don't know. Um, you have a, a particular preference that you use? Yeah, I, I have a variety of clays. Um, here's a piece I'm working on and she's done in, in the Roma Plastilina number one. And I know Roma has sulfur. A lot of artists don't like the sulfur, but but I find that it's it's really um, kind of creamy and easy to work with. So I usually recommend that to my students because I don't want them to have to heat it up too much. So, she's so typically, typically you still have to heat up clay a little bit to to sculpt, right? Well, especially in the winter time, you know. Um, so the warmer it is, the uh, the softer it is. So I usually put my clay on top of my wood stove here. I got, I have these pans, you know, where I heat it up. Now in the summertime, you just put it outside in your car and it'll get really soft. So I have Roma, I have Chavant clays, uh, clean clay is a clay I really like. Here's a different type of plastiline. You can see they're all different colors. That's JMAC um, sulfur free. These are some demos I'm doing from my Patreon page, little structural figures. And then there it is again, that's the JMAC. So it looks like terracotta, but it's actually oil-based. Now, when you, uh, when you sculpt a head like that, uh, what, what do you put it on? I've heard so many different stories. I've heard, heard people say you can just kind of wad up some newspaper and, and build around that. I've heard people say that you need a, a wire uh, infrastructure, what what typically do you do? Yeah, I would definitely have some kind of pipe. I mean, this one has a threaded rod inside of it. It's not, it's not a very big sculpture, so it didn't need a lot. Um, others I use, um, you know, plumbing pipe. But you, do you, like, do you have to right have, it. is it just a pipe or is it, do you have to create something that creates a head, the shape of a head? Uh, yeah, a lot of times I'll have wire um, on top of the pipe. Now, somebody told me, somebody told me to do this. Uh, what I did is I took a pipe and then I took a, a wig head. Uh -huh. Somebody said you can take a wig head and put clay over that. It doesn't seem very, um, uh, seems <laughs> like it's going to be awkward, but I, but I did build it. I don't know if I'm going to use it. <laughs> yeah. I'd say with that, just make sure it's really lean, really small because you don't want to run into that foam. You know, and that's that's where I prefer to have more clay than than uh, than filler. Although when you get into bigger sculptures, you do need to use foam because the weight is so massive. Like 
like her drapery down here, you know, I, I have foam in there to keep it lighter because otherwise it's just it's too much. I see. Yeah, you know, it's too heavy. So, okay. but you cool. can see my pipe in the back that leads to a wire skeleton that holds her up. So she's she's really dependent on that pipe for support. Right. And then the wire skeleton, I assume, goes down down into the arms and so on. Yep. Yep. Every finger has has a little wire inside it. So I like my clay soft, but you have to support it with something. All right. Terrific. So uh, I don't know anything about anything else about the studio. I've got shelving to store stuff. As a sculptor, you just need more um, strong shelves than the normal. And then my wood stove, this is my main heat source. And I find that that's plenty in this space. This space is 28 by 28 feet. So um, I just have that. And then I have an air conditioner through the wall. Uh -huh. a, lot of people, a lot of people ask about that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm excited about this. We'll, we'll go ahead and let you get, get rolling on what you're going to teach us today. Okay. All right. Let me get this closer. So here I have um, my newest planes of the head. And I know some of you have seen planes of the heads, you know, for purchase online. And I've done, I've done several of these. Whenever I teach a workshop, I do another one. Um, this one I started for the Portrait Society of America. And I think what I'm gonna do is perfect it and then cast it. So on my website, I have it for sale, pre-cast special. If you order before December 15th, you save $50. So mm -hmm. it's just rickcaselli.com slash planeshead. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is explain briefly um, what I put here and why I put it here. So let me grab my calipers. Try to get this closer for you. Whoops. Everything's backwards. All right, here we go. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the main things um, I see in portrait painters and sculptors that they miss is, is simply the getting the whole of the head, understanding the entirety of the head, the front of the face and the back of the head. So, um, you know, one of the things you notice when you pick up a skull is just the flare, you know, from the chin to the, what's called the parietal eminence up here. So make sure you get that flare. And it's like every drawing book, they put an egg shape, a chicken egg. Yeah. Um, and that might seem elementary, but I can't tell you how many times I see sculptures where there's not enough width at the top of the head. So just think um, formally as human beings, we have a big brain and we have a, a delicate face and that's different from other mammals. So that's kind of the essence of who we are. So make sure you get that nice egg shape and put it on a nice healthy cylinder. So then remember the neck, before you get into all these little muscles, the neck is just a cylinder. So on this, this planes of the head, I've kept one side very geometric and the other side is going to be more organic. You can kind of see those, those smaller fleshy forms. So we'll get up close here. And usually fleshy forms are what gets you into trouble. Okay. So, so, you can learn all the anatomy in the world, but if you don't have an understanding of the geometry of the head, then you're not gonna know how to organize it into something useful. So that's why I'm leaving this side very um, geometric. Let's see. All right, I'm getting used to this program. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, everything's backwards. Yeah, everything's backwards. <laughs> So just think of geometry as the great organizer of, of the anatomy. And, and that's why Greek sculpture looks so soundly created because it's very geometric and it's very mathematical. So I would say, um, you know, the main thing in a portrait is the action. 
you know, what's the pose? So if you're sketching in charcoal, you might just draw a vertical line, um, maybe with a curve to it. You know, certainly with this figure, I want to draw a very, really long line from the head down to the toe. And with a portrait, it's the same thing. You know, you have to think about what's the direction of the form. So that would be the main event, as my teacher Cedric Egley calls it. The main event is that he's a vertical. So that's just action or pose. And the next thing I'd say is what's the proportion of that form? And the proportion is the height to width. So when I talked about, you know, this being the widest point of the head, you know, you want to make those comparative measurements. And um, proportions will also help you organize the gross anatomy. So will you actually hold those calipers up to your model? Oh, yeah. When I'm doing something life size, you know, just go up, go directly up to them and, and get that measurement. So a lot of you probably measure from the inside corner of the eye to the chin. You know, I can do that directly with these and then make a mark on the clay. And that's going to give me my halfway point for the head. So proportions are really important. That's going to tell you male or female. It's going to tell you age. Um, it's going to tell you lifestyle, body type, all those things, height to width. So as a portrait artist, um, proportions really give you a lot of the likeness. You know, it's not everything, but, you know, if you can get the eyes, nose, and mouth in the right spot, it's going to kind of look like the person. Um, but then you also have to get the back of the head in the right spot in relation to the front of the head, you know. So that that's some of the things I'm... I like to teach. Um, so you have action, proportion, and then um, you have your gross anatomy, which is all the muscles, the bones, the tendons, the ligaments. And, you know, those things are sort of seductive because they're, they're fun to learn and they're important. But again, if you don't have a system to organize them, it's, it's just a, a mess. So, what well, really helps to organize all the gross anatomy is the proportions and the geometry. And I'd say one more thing would be the linear rhythms. So if you can let your eye flow from like, the, let's say the front of the head to the back of the head into the chest, maybe up the front of the neck to the downward plane of the brow ridge. Again, like this figure. You know, the only way to get things in the right spot is to move move your eye in long patterns to see the relationships. Stephen Assale always talks about that as, as creating a flow line through the design of your, of your figure. Yeah. Yeah. We call it a line of action, you know, and it's something uh, John Eversberger taught me in high school. Um, and he would show me cartoons. Now every cartoon has a line of action to show, to tell the story is the little mouse jumping forward or being punched backwards, you know, so it's those big things that are really important and that's what's going to make your work great. So if you don't have the big stuff correct, nobody's going to want to walk up to your piece to look at the little stuff. And I think um, little stuff is very dazzling up close, so it gets a lot of attention. Uh, but again, you want to be, um, one story that comes to mind is I was in the National Gallery with my teacher, Cedric, Egley. And there's Thomas Aiken's paintings on one wall, and then there's Sargent paintings on another wall in the same room. And it's almost not fair, but um, <laughs> but he was explaining to me, wow, that he said, he didn't think about it. He just said, it looks like the Aiken's um, clients have been sitting there for three hours, whereas the Sargent clients looked like they just sat down and said hello. You know, so there was a freshness to the Sargent's. And he equated that to, um, you know, the overall geometry and the expression of the of the figure from the ground up, as well as the, you know, the pink coloration to the cheeks and everything else. But um, it just looked like Sargent was talking to his models, whereas Aikens was kind of approaching them like a still life. So anyway, um, I don't want to get off on a tangent on that, but. Well, I think your your point about the basics is really true in painting as well. It's in, you know, if, if you're doing a landscape painting or a figure painting, you're really starting out with big shapes or big planes. So it, it, it really is very similar, I would think. Yeah, like what's, again, what's the main event? 
Is it the light smacking up against a barn? You know, the big shadow of the tree. So I would start with the biggest thing you can and take that part of the painting very seriously before you get into the smaller things because all the smaller stuff is dependent on the big statement. So, so speaking of big statements, um, in the geometry, you know, you can liken a head to a house. And this is a, um, this is an analogy that's really helped me that a house has a rooftop, like a dome, has a side plane, it has a frontal facade. I suppose it has an underneath plane at the basement. Um, but what you can see here is the division between the top of the house and the side of the house at the temporal ridge of the skull. So we call this the gutters of the house because it's showing you that division. Hmm. So in this lighting, you know, the side of the house is in the shade or the half tone, whereas the top is very bright. So every form change is a color change. So what you can do is find that temporal ridge and then continue it right down to the side of the cheek into the chin. And that's a pretty classic plain change. You'll see it in Vanderpool. You'll see it in the Bridgman books where he's dividing the, the front of the face from the side along this, I call it the, you know, the zygomatic major into the triangularis muscle. But essentially it's the front of your, your jowl, you know? As we get older, we get a little more, a little more front plane there. How important is it to, to learn anatomy, learn the names of the muscles? Is that, I, is that? Yeah. Cool? I think it's important um, because when you have a name, if you catalog the muscles in your head and when you, when you say the name to yourself, it conjures up a certain shape, a certain muscle. Um, but again, you have to have a system to organize it. So as far as gross anatomy, just try to learn like two or three muscles a week and it's, it's accumulative. So you don't have to learn it all at once. I mean, it'd be nice if you could just download it in your brain with a memory stick, but you can't. That's coming. That's coming. <laughs> That's spooky. <laughs> Google actually says it's possible. Oh, uh, so just just pick up a few things each week. And, um, you know, if you have to teach anatomy, that's really how you learn it, because you have to actually explain it to people. So so I'm still learning little muscles that I didn't know about. But there's some big ones um, in the artistic anatomy realm. So that temporal ridge is a good landmark. You know, this 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 side plane roughly follows the zygomaticus major. This smaller one will follow zygomaticus minor. And then if I, if I squeak this over into the light more, this will be the front of your masseter muscle, that, that chewing muscle on the side of your jaw. So you can see how the, the planes relate to those landmarks. Um, I would think about the center of the face like the keel of a boat. And, I, oh. and that's, a, um, that's a phrase I'm stealing from my teacher, Cedric. But, you know, his father built, his father was a portrait artist, but he also built wooden sailing boats. And he was very sculptural in his thinking. So um, his father, Bjorn Agli, really influenced Cedric's ways of thinking. But Cedric would say to me that, the center of the face is like the keel of a boat if you put it down in the water. So there's a ridge in the middle, which obviously is the nose, but also the projection of the teeth. So, you know, when you do a nose, think of it in planes, having a nice healthy side plane, a skinny front plane, and a corresponding side plane there. A very intense undercut underneath the nose. So if you want to think about which planes are up and down, you know, I call these the undercuts, the eye sockets. They're not strictly under, but they're, they're under enough that they're smoky. You just want to think about your eyes being shaded. Under the nose, you get that nice shadow. Upper lip, usually darker than the lower lip because it's going under. And then certainly underneath the bottom lip, you'll get a nice shadow and the jawline. So 
That's another way to break down the head. There's all kinds of ways to break it down. Um, but that would be up planes and downward facing planes. I just call them undercuts. Because if you're doing a painting, you mix up your shadow color and you hit those, those undercuts and you're gonna have, it'll kind of look like a skull, you know? And um, if you can get sort of the, those shapes, the right size and in the right spot, it's gonna look like somebody's skull and it'll look like them from a distance. And that's so kind what of- is the, What is the key to getting likeness? Well, I'd say mostly proportions. Uh, beyond that, I would look at how people move, how they tend to sit, how they tend to stand. And that's gonna determine how you pose them in your portraits. So, you know, you don't wanna pose a very active person crumpled up on a couch. You wanna show them who they are. Uh, so you might want them standing, looking very uh, alert. Um, if someone's kind of, they kind of have loose joints and they, they like to lounge around, well, maybe they're the type you wanna drape over a couch. So I, I think the way you pose people is important. Also, the way you light them, the way, the way you let the light fall across their forms will either um, highlight their forms or it'll obscure their forms depending on how you do it. So I think lighting is important. Um, posing, finding the right chair if they're going to sit, finding the right, the right clothing. Definitely. So how, how close, if you were working with a model yeah. and doing a portrait like this, where would you be? Where would the model be? They'd be right there beside you? Yeah, they'd be right next to the head. And then I'd be running far away to look at both of them and then running up and doing something and then running oh, back. Like sight size. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but again, staying very active and stepping back a lot. I mean, I'm talking every every 15 seconds, maybe, step back. And, and yeah. so when you're turning, let's say you're turning your, your turnstile there so you can, you can see the side. Yeah. How do you deal with that with the model? Do you walk off to the side of the model and look and then, and then turn that, or do you turn the model? Um, if I'm by myself, I'll oftentimes wheel my stand around the studio. If I'm in a class, we'll have the model actually turn, and then everyone turns their... Lazy Susan. Um, but I will have the model move around the studio too, because I want to see, you know, if one side's in the shadow for an hour, I want to flip that around and see it in the light, you know? Right. Uh, so I have the model move a lot. And actually, I, I like that because it keeps them fresh and um, I get to get to know them and see how they move. So if, they, if they've been sitting too long, have them stand up and just work standing. They like that, you know? Um, so stay, stay very active. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't get crunched up in your chair too much. You know, they always say, draw from your shoulder, not your, not your wrist. Right. So this side, um, just to summarize, what this is, is an explanation of, geometric planes in the way a painter would think in the spirit of John Vanderpool or George Bridgman. So in this case, I'm cruising over the form in large shapes on top of the form. So if you do your light and shade, that's what you'd wanna do. Now on this side, I'm thinking in elevations. I'm thinking through the forms, underneath, above, um, and I'm bringing in some of these more organic, fleshy forms. So I'd say it's better to learn this first before you get to this. So but what's the learning? What's the learning process like? If you were going to recommend somebody going from the beginning, would it would it be withdrawing first? Would it be plaster uh, cast and copying cast? What, what's your process? I would say, um, yeah, drawing is kind of the core of everything in the sense that drawing is making form. Um, for me, my training was, was lots of figure drawing and portrait drawing and charcoal, vine charcoal from life. And then I would do pencil sketches from photographs at night, pencil sketches from fine art books, um, art teaching books like Bridgman and Vanderpool. I'd copy Sargent heads and pencil. And um, 
I think cast drawing is good because you, you have it like a still life you can, you can uh, render the form from. So it's a good way to learn light and shade and perhaps anatomy as well. Um, but working from life is important because, because we're not statues, you know, we move. So you have to, um, you got to move with the model and your brain has to move just as quickly as them too. So in life drawing, you're not copying so much as you're reconstructing the person um, on the fly. You know, it's a very active thing. So that demands that you learn about the rib cage shape, the that shape of the head, the, the next the cylinder, you know, the, you really want to feel the structure of the bones. Um, and in that sense, you're not, you're not a slave to copying, you're sort of liberated through your knowledge of form. So I think working from life is tremendous. Do still life, do landscape, um, and then do some, in the winter time, do some sculpting. Um, you know, try doing a head in clay, just get some cheap terracotta clay. Um, but it'll be accumulative. I remember when I was studying with Steve Perkins, we would do about, uh, I think a month out of the year with Steve and we do a, a head, I'm sorry, a figure in the morning and a head in the afternoon, uh, you know, five days a week for a month. And I did that probably five or six years. And that was a way to actually learn the anatomy and the planes. But it's endless, I'm still learning. So I'd say do, do a combination of all of it. Um, and finally get into oil painting because painting uh, will show you how to do the massing of the planes. So, you know, your drawing helps your painting, but your painting also helps your sculpting. You know, and your sculpting helps your drawing. So it's kind of a cycle. But if, if you get really good at painting, massing in light and shade, well, that's gonna make you a better sculptor because all of a sudden you can spot those planes and colors very quickly. Um, so it's, it's all interconnected if you're creating form. Now, if you're just copying stuff, it doesn't really matter what you do, I guess. But if you're interested in, in reconstructing reality and boiling it down to its essence, which I think is what the fine, you know, great masters did, um, then each discipline helps the other. Kind of hard to do a self-portrait in a uh, in clay, isn't it? Because you can't see the back back of your head. Well, I've done it. Um, you know, I looked in a mirror to do this one, but then I had a friend take some pictures from the side of me. Uh huh. This is just the front of it. Right. But you can do it. Yeah. I mean, I'd say if you don't have a model, especially nowadays, you know, use yourself. Look in the mirror. And it's kind do of neat. Do, do you ever do plaster casts of it, of anyone? Oh, you mean life casts? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So like for this this thing I'm working on behind me, I did a number of hands and feet as a reference for her. And I have pictures of that model. This is uh this is uh the life the the cast of Abraham Lincoln. Oh yeah, yeah. That's and a good I, think I got this at, at the uh at, at uh, the Chester Chesterfield uh, Chesterwood uh -huh. Chesterwood, it's hard. Uh, this camera distorts, but this was essentially done when he died, and uh, so I think it's pretty cool. But I've been thinking about doing plaster casts of other people just so I can learn how you know how that works, and then maybe try to sculpt from those because getting live models isn't necessarily easy. Yeah, yeah, they make some some really neat products now. Um, there's alginate and there's something called double body silk. I think it's called, it's a, it's a, um, I guess it's non-toxic latex or something, but you know, you just drip it on someone's face and then you, you peel it off. Um, so that can be kind of fun, uh, especially for learning those smaller forms. One thing I'll mention though, when you make a life cast of someone laying back, it's really gonna pull their forms Oh yeah, and then back a little bit. So they're not going to look exactly the way they look when they're standing up. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, and again, with the neck, I've added musculature um, and more of an ecroche style. You know, the main the main muscle people get attracted to is the sternocleidomastoid muscles. So I've tried to put those on without disrupting the 
the cylinder of the neck too much. And uh, there's a few others, you know, the, the trapezius in the back, the clavicles down here create like a shelf. Um, there's some smaller muscles. So my plan is to make a little, a little cheat sheet for this that will be shipped out with the plane's head. I do have a finished ear. You know, with ears, just learn the cartilage of the ear completely, and you can pretty much make an ear out of your head once you learn the parts. Interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll, again, I'll show the uh, I'll, I'll show the website, which uh, I looked it up on your website, and it's rickcasali.com slash storage slash planes head. Oh, that's it. Right. Good. Yeah. So if you but if you go to rickcaselli.com and just go to the store, you can find it. Yeah, great. Thanks. And I'll yeah, say absolutely. Well, we're trying to help everybody during COVID times, and we, we hope people will buy stuff because it's good for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you just have to adjust. I'm a, when I realized this lockdown wasn't ending, I just decided got to be totally, um, you know, self-sufficient as much as possible. You can't really rely on any school or, or anything. So I'm doing my Patreon page now. Um, where I have lots of teaching videos on these concepts. And it's only $10 a month. So that's patreon.com slash Rick Casale, my name. Um, and you can just try it out. Um, I do about four videos a month. I only promise two, but I usually do four or five. And right now we're doing the whole figure. So I'm doing the entire rib cage, pelvis, head, appendages, hands and feet. Uh, that'll probably go into, into, uh, into March or April. And then um, I have a, a workshop coming up that's sold out in person, but you can take it virtually through um, the Zoom app. And that's January 6th through 10th, I believe. Um, and you just go to my website, rickcaselli.com slash classes. And that'll, that'll give you that figure workshop link. Yeah, terrific. Well, uh, I, I would highly recommend it to anybody, any painter who wants to learn to do better, better portraiture, better figures. Uh, I think it's going to inform your work. And Quite frankly, I think even it would inform your work if you're a landscape artist. And, and plus, you'll have something fun. You'll be learning something new. Yeah, they say if you can sculpt a figure, you can you can do anything, you know? So there's the great debate, right? Uh, which is which is more difficult? Uh, painting or sculpture? Yeah. Um, I'd say, you know, anything done well is difficult. But... <laughs> That's true. You know, with a painting... Um, the added difficulty I see is you have to learn the language of color because you're you're creating the illusion of three dimensional form on a 2D plane. Um, in sculpture, it's more direct. You're actually making the form, but then you got to worry about it falling over. You got to not just sculpt the face, but you got to sculpt the little pinky toe. So uh, it's you, you're you're doing a 360 painting all of a sudden. So it, sculpture can be a lot more time consuming, I think. Um, not always, but I think you know what I'm saying. I think. Do you have Do you have uh, anything in the studio that's at a very early beginning stage so that we can get a feel for clay massed in on something? Yeah, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this head. This head, I just kind of started. I mean, it's a small head, so I could work quickly. Um, but that's pretty much the skull shape. Maybe that's further along than you'd want. Here's a little. Well, try to get a try to get an understanding of what. Here's what a little sketch of a boy. You can see. See, it's kind of rough. Um, now, when I'm teaching, I'll really boil it down to its fundamental form. So, this is how I'm teaching them the, the whole body, sort of a mannequin like approach and um well, you got a lot of different things going on at one time don't you yeah this is from my leg lesson on patreon and this was a demo from a recent workshop where i'm explaining the arm now look to the right there just a second right there what's that ma is that a mass of clay <laughs> so this is you asked about armature this is clay on a um, wire armature for a head so I, I'm tearing that down to use it for my big figure over here. 
Um, this is the small figure I did in preparation for this larger one. And she's called the dreamer. Once you've done something in the oil clay, do you keep it forever? Or do you, once you've done your cast, you reuse the clay? No, once you do your, once your cast is done, then you tear it down. Oh, what a disaster. <laughs> yeah, that's somewhat liberating. And do you, do you make your own uh, plaster casts or do you send them out? I do my own casting a lot, but because I started as a painter, I never really learned to make my own molds. Um, I know that the principles involved, but I don't really trust myself. So I, I do contract my mold making out to other sculptors. Um, and bronze casting, I have to contract that out to a bronze foundry because I can't pour bronze here, but I pour plaster here and I pour resin in the studio. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, there's so much to learn. It's fascinating. Great. Well, I'm happy to share it with everybody. Well, I've really, I've really enjoyed this today. It's, it's, uh, something that, that those of us who are painters don't think about and, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what got me excited about, about 3D is I've got a friend by the name of Richard Taylor who runs a company called Weta Workshop in New Zealand. And I took a group of artists to New Zealand to meet with uh, meet there. They did, you know, Lord of the Rings and they, you know, and, and uh, to, um, to, you know, hundreds, hundreds of films and they do a lot of the costumes and a lot of the molding. And <clears throat> anyway, he has a team of sculptors uh, who do nothing but sculpt for for masks for the movies and things of that nature. And um, so he decided he needed to keep them busy during times when most movie companies lay people off, and he wanted to make sure he kept his people employed. So he would have them sculpt things for their own uh, for their own joy uh -huh. uh, and and pay them while they were uh, while they were not working on any other projects. And then he built a sculpture garden outside of uh, Wellington, which he took me to as, uh, as a guest. So he's got these, this massive, probably 30-acre property filled with uh, unbelievably beautiful sculptures. It's all private. He Once in a while, he'll do a fundraiser or something there. And you'll see you know, sculptures from Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or some of the other films. It's mostly fantasy sculpture. And it just got me so excited about it. And then he took me into his his studio where he does sculpting and kind of showed me the ropes and, and got me excited. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm pursuing this now. Wow. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my students are in special effects or they make video games, you know, they, they, they sculpt everything on the computer. Um, so I, I really like those students because their livelihood depends on learning this stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, gotta be good. It's more immediate, you know, it's more, uh, intense yeah so um are, are you mostly doing commission work are you doing things that you sell in galleries what what's the how do you make your income teaching yeah, yeah all the above i mean i have small pieces that i sell in galleries locally um and in provincetown massachusetts um and then i do i have bigger commissions that are long more long term like this this figure and she has a sister to her who's being molded right now. So they're going to both going to be bronzed. Um, so commissions like that and also portrait commissions. I'm actually about to do three portrait paintings um, in the new year. So I will be back painting. And then I do teaching. Uh, you know, teaching is usually about 30% to 40% of my income. Mm -hmm. It's surprising sometimes how much it is. Uh, but now I'm teaching online, so that's good. Yeah. Well, I'll encourage everybody to go to your website, rickcaselli.com, and uh, check out. You've got a store there. You can get, would you say you've got a special on the Planes of the Head pre -cast? Yeah, if you, if you order by December 15th, uh, you'll save 50 bucks, and I'll give you free shipping to the U.S. mainland. So well, that's, I call that the precast special because you're buying it before it's molded. Yeah, well, it's going to get done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll put my order in today. Okay. All right. Hey, appreciate it. Yeah. So we got, uh, we by the end of the day, we'll have 10, 12,000 people who have seen this on different platforms. So hopefully we'll, we'll help you sell a couple of those. Oh, well, very grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, be grateful if it works. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Rick, thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate you taking the time and and uh, showing us a little bit. <clears throat> where, where is there a place that is a kind of a place where people buy sculpting clays and tools? It's kind of a resource. Oh yeah. So I really like Sculpture House. Um, they're in Florida, sculpturehouse.com. And also the Complete Sculptor in New York City. I use them a lot. Um, that's where I send my students for tools, clay, uh, mold making materials. So they're and both. They're is both there a good source for plaster casts? I know it looked like you had a few of those around. Oh, yeah. Um, I like Juiced Gallery in Boston. They're in, I think, in Woburn, Massachusetts. So some of these are from Juiced. Also, um, um, Felice Calci. He's in Italy. I think his name's Andrea Calci. You can look him up on Instagram, Felice. And he's got a lot of good stuff. Um, who else? I think those are the two that are really high quality. You know, I've got some of these are mine and some of these are antique, but there's a Henry Henchy drawing right there. Oh, wow. Those are both Henry Henchies. Fabulous. This is a painting by my teacher, Cedric, from the 70s. And uh, that's a painting by Michael Shane Neal of me. Oh, a fabulous. A few years ago. So, <laughs> so the little things that inspire me. And yeah, was, Michael was a tragic loss. That was so sad. Oh, I'm sorry. Michael Shane Neal. Who, who are you talking about? Uh, Michael Shane Neal. Say it again. Sorry. Got <clears throat> Michael Shane Neal. Oh, he's still alive. Oh, I don't think oh, so. You're talking about his teacher, Kinsler. Maybe. No, no, M Michael, Michael passed away too. <clears throat> Pretty sure. Just recently. No. Yeah. No way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Kinsler passed away, and then he he passed away last year. I'm pretty sure. I may be wrong. People will correct oh, me. Maybe uh, Ed Jonas. Maybe. No. 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 Well, I just I just texted him. <laughs> oh, did you really? Okay. Well, this is going to be controversial. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, we'll find out. I, if hope, you get a response. I hope he's still alive. <laughs> we'll find out if you get a response. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, Rick, thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. And everybody go to rickcaselli.com, check it out. And uh, we've learned a lot. It's been fabulous. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Eric.